Driving dish, driving dish, George's driving dish. Welcome back, everyone, to the George Niang Driving Dish Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. She's a woman of the people. She's a Utah native. We have Mayor Erin Mendenhall on our hands here. Thank you so much for joining us, Erin. Thank you for almost driving with me and having me on your show. Oh, no, this is awesome. You know, I would have cleaned up and got real nice for, you know, this special occasion. But, you know, I'm practicing social distancing. So nobody's yeah. getting cleaned up nowadays. It's like November, but it's April. Yeah, I mean, this this quarantine, this uh, this virus has us all combining days um, into one, so. And wardrobes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell people about my wardrobes, but I'm embarrassed what they'd think of me. <laughs> so let, let's talk about this. Um, you assumed this position as mayor four months ago. You know, I'm usually when I, have an accomplishment like that, I take a couple weeks to, you know, celebrate, <laughs> enjoy myself, but no, not you. You just get, hit with, a, you just get hit with a pandemic, um, then an earthquake, uh, which by the way, uh, I was standing under my door frame, all six, seven of me trying to, to dodge that. Uh, how, how do you, how do you go about this? Uh, you know, you're just rolled into this job and you all of a sudden are asked to, be stepped into a huge leadership role and then something I, I want to say catastrophic happens because I don't know if we'll ever experience something like this in Salt Lake City uh, ever again. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, but it's not something any of us predicted for sure. Um, I, I came into office on January 6th, so I, I haven't hit 100 days quite yet. And I think two weeks into it, we opened the Sugar House Temporary Shelter which was like an around the clock effort to get that shelter up and running. And uh, that felt like a big lift. And then the pandemic came along and um, the day of earthquakes a couple weeks ago and eight or nine days of aftershocks. But you know, I've said it's sort of like um, training in an athletic way, which most people don't know what I'm talking about. And certainly I have zero caliber of experience compared to you, George, but maybe you can relate that like going through a campaign is kind of like going to like boot camp or, you know, training every day. And like you get sore and you're doing stuff that's kind of out there for your comfort level, and but you build up the muscle. And so in a lot of ways, I think this first hundred days of craziness um, I was pretty well trained for just because of the the chaos of running a mayoral campaign. So it's not that I want this to continue, but I do feel capable. And the biggest part of that, though, is because Salt Lake City has amazing employees. I have like truly amazing people that I get to work with who help me make good decisions on a day to day basis, hopefully to uh, navigate this and make sure that we're going to be resilient as a city. I mean, when I think about, you know, you being a mayor and you're you're trying to compare your life to me and I'm sitting here thinking like, gosh, I, it, I, it's hard enough for me to take care of myself. You have to take care of, you know, your family, your three kids, your husband, and then all of us, uh, well, I, can, I can only imagine. I, you'd have to ask my kids and my husband if they think I'm doing at all a good job of taking care of anybody. I was, uh, <laughs> Looking at your social media account and you know, you have a selfie stick, you're out here at parks that are recently purchased. I mean, you are just all about the people and I think that's what makes Utah such a unique place and uh, no wonder why you're our leader and, and are in charge. And, okay. and that gets me uh, to my next question. What, with everything that's gone on, right, what in the world would make you want to be mayor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a labor of love for sure and and what you said just a second ago is the whole reason why I love people I've always loved people I make friends at the grocery store or on a walk or whatever um, I I think that there's value in every single person and and in every conversation that you have and there's few other jobs like working in public service where you get to um, decide every day to walk out there, make yourself um, accessible enough to 
um, and confident enough that you can walk out there and say what you think and what you feel and at the same time uh, be open to learning from the person you're speaking to or the group that you're speaking to and the, that confidence kind of goes both ways. It allows me to say what I think and it also allows me to change as I learn and I'm impacted by my community and my neighbors. So, and that's like, it's an incredibly moving um, exercise and practice and I get to do that for work. So uh, I think you know what it is like to love your job. And what's that saying that you never really work if you love the job that you do? That's very true. We're doing a lot of hours right now and um, public service includes a lot of hours, but it is absolutely a labor of love for me. And I like solving problems, so that working in city government is a really good fit. I was going to say, we, we have enough problems to throw your way, that is for sure. <laughs> We're making up new problems. We have so many problems. Yes, we are. And uh, you talk about being a, a problem solver, I think, you know, from what you've talked about before, is just uh, coming together as one and keeping the community together. And uh, my next question would be, what ideas and what projects, you know, have you stirred up or started or are thinking of, even though it's, you know, things are kind of slowing down during this time, okay. you know, you want to share with us so we can have somewhat of a, a positive light through this, you know, tough time. Oh, there's a bunch of them. So the one of them you just mentioned that just happened this week, which is that uh, we used parks impact fees. Those are money that we collect from developers when they build, whether it's a, a new single family house or a 400 unit apartment complex, every city gets to collect impact fees so that their existing taxpayers don't have to shoulder the burden of increased service uh, or pressure on the park system, the streets, the public safety, and the utilities. And we can only spend those dollars on those exact things. The state requires that you do that. So we've had a pool of money for parks and pack fees that was growing over the last couple of months. And we were able to use that money, even during this time of crisis, when it cannot be used for anything else, to acquire Allen Park, which uh, locally is known as Hobbitville. And if you were a teenager who grew up in Salt Lake City, you probably tried to sneak into Allen Park at some point. <laughs> Um, cool kids go there, right? It's a really funky little spot with some really cool art throughout and peacocks and turkeys and things. It's seven acres and it's in the heart of Sugar House. So we just bought that this week. It was going to be uh, purchased by a private housing developer and, and remained and going to into the future being inaccessible to the public. But that's an exciting thing that just happened. Um, and I think at the broader level, I see growth as uh, a great tool for us to get what we need and want as this capital city. We know we're growing, we've been growing, hopefully we're gonna continue growing and I believe we will. And it's a part of why I wanted to run for office was because um, I like analogies, George, so if you'll allow me a bit. I used to, I used to be a baker a little bit and um, I think when we're growing like this, it's kind of like when you've got your mound of bread dough and you can like shape it into whatever you want. You can make rolls, you can make a bunch of loaves, you can make a big braided ring loaf. And at this point, we can either work with this dough that we have as we're growing and shape it the way we need and want as a city, or we can sit back the way that we have, in my opinion, too much in our past and let the growth happen in a way that we are not participating enough in to get out of it. So to that end, I wanna see public transportation grow in Salt Lake City in a dramatic way that connects people with the opportunities that are happening in this city um, across our city, from the west side to the east side, north side to the south side. And we've had geographic inequity happening in Salt Lake City forever. Um, our west side res residents in particular have less economic access, they have less housing security, they have less food security, they have uh, a lower graduation rate, um, and many other factors that we can and do measure. And it's time that we start to take this growth and make Salt Lake City more equitable. Someone, someone told me, they said, I told them that I was, you know, going to be having uh, Mayor Mendenhall, you know, on my my podcast and they were like oh 
she is so awesome. Like when she's <laughs> in the room, like she can, can take control of the room. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is my show. You're she, in control. She can't come and do this. I hold the <laughs> microphone. No, oh I'm God. kidding. We're going to break off into a fun segment right now. So I'm called the minivan. I don't know if you know, but the story behind it is I was subbed into a game last year. We were playing the Brooklyn Nets at home and I had an opportunity to go up and dunk it. Mind you, I had just got in the game and it's tough to get loose. Like It's like just waking up and having to give a big speech. You know, sometimes you gotta splash some water on your face. Uh -huh. I didn't have the opportunity to do that. So I went up and tried to dunk it and I barely laid it in and everybody was making fun of me. So I came back and I was like, listen, all you guys are like Ferraris. I'm like a minivan. I need a couple <laughs> of laps around the block before I, I get going. So if you could be a vehicle, oh, gee. what would it be and why? Oh, I, I, would, I would say a Prius because you're so involved in the environment <laughs> and you do so many nice things for other people. That's, that's yeah, what I'm thinking. Christmas. Christmas. I, I have driven a Leaf for a long time and it's a little bit small for my family of five. Mm. Um, but it's really faster than it looks, so it's pretty fun to drive. Um, I would love to have a Tesla someday. I think all electric. I could. The hybrid is not where my heart is, even though it's where my family size is right now. <laughs> uh, but I would definitely be something all electric that can go zero to sixty three fast. I love it. I love it. We can roll with that. We but can... have you seen that new Tesla truck? I don't it think is... I have. It is really weird, and so I would eliminate that one because it looks like uh, something from an old Tina Turner movie. Listen, I don't discriminate. Uh, I, I used love to call Tina. It, I, I used to call the minivan a loser cruiser, and now it's uh, my self-proclaimed <laughs> nickname. So you just have to roll with it. You know, the friend with the minivan though is who you call when you all want to go somewhere together. So there's a functionality there that right. everybody benefits from. Should I just have an emblem on the side that just says, we are one? <laughs> In this van? <laughs> yes, exactly. Now that, you know, we, we have a pandemic, there was an earthquake. I can only imagine how many meetings or phone calls that you had to have uh, before that. But I guess I'll run you through how, how it happened with me is, so we came come back from Oklahoma City after, you know, we figured out two of our teammates had uh, the coronavirus, and we're quarantined for 14 days. You know, um, Angela, Dr. Angela Dunn did a great job of explaining what needed to happen. And then, like six days into it, there's an earthquake. Now, let me tell you my emotions, right? I'm supposed to be quarantined. I'm on the fifth floor of an apartment complex. My, my apartment is shaking. Uh, I don't know what to do. So, I can. Like I said before, I can barely take care of myself. I was freaking out, called my mom, and you know what she told me? George, it's probably just construction going on top of the roof. <laughs> and I was like, mom, like this is not what I need I'm right now. I'm not making this up. And, and that's when I think of you is where like, I'm sure you have a bunch of phone calls where people are looking at you and where do I go from here? We're you know in a crisis right now with the pandemic. You know, there's an earthquake that doesn't really happen in Salt Lake City and people are looking at you and I can only imagine the amount of pressure that you have, one, to get your three kids and husband all in order and then get a whole city together. Yeah, the emotions are wide, right? Uh, we had, I remember on earthquake day, we had someone call into our 911 who insisted on talking to the supervisor and said, why didn't you tell us the earthquake was coming? That's what that's what they wanted to know. So I think there's an, an expectation or a belief that we have a lot more of a control over the situation than, than we actually do. And But I think that's what we all want on a, in a moment like this when we don't know what, what the end looks like or when it is. We don't know how many people in our community are going to be infected and how many are going to die. We don't know really what our economy is going to look like when we start leaving our houses again and come outside. And that is justifiably scary to every single one of us. When we can assume the best of each other, even when on the face it might not look or feel like that, uh, those graces will save us pain and suffering and help us to recover as a community faster. And I think we all know that's true in our guts, but in the moment when you're feeling upset 
but frustrated or alone, um, grace is, is going to help us as a community and as individuals. So that's my, that's my practice as I go through this. Um, I, I like to read poetry too, and that's a way for me to uh, kind of recenter in the morning or before I go to bed at night. And I think, you know, each of us come up with those kind of um, ways to console ourselves. But I will say one more thing about the earthquake, which is, I think we were in like the best position we probably could have been to have an earthquake where schools were already shut down, people were home with their families, people have been stocking up on groceries and <laughs> were like prepared to be home. And our emergency operations center as a city, as a county and as a state were up and rocking. Like they'd already been activated and had those emergency uh, scenarios and communication streams going. So we were in pretty good shape, knock on wood, that the big one doesn't happen. You know, speaking of uh, calming down, obviously the city of Salt Lake is is pretty uh, calm right now. And um, I know a clean environment is super important to you. Um, obviously with, you know, you wanting to do things with, you know, planting trees and that was supposed to happen, you know, on Earth Day. And I just want to know, do you think like the home orders or the mandates that have been put in, um, do you see that helping with the environment in Salt Lake oh, City? Totally. I mean, our air quality is spectacular right now. Isn't it beautiful? I'm breathing fresh air. Open I love your it. windows. It's beautiful. <laughs> Even up there on the fifth floor. Um, yeah, definitely. We've seen, a, as you said, downtown is really quiet. Uh, there's basically not a rush hour right now because so many people are working from home and our air quality is benefiting from that. I wonder, maybe you do too, how this experience of um, going through this pandemic and like companies, like the company my husband works for and, and lots of others I've heard about who said, we can't be a teleworking company. Like that's not possible for us. And then along comes COVID-19 and they have had to rethink everything. Um, and I wonder how it's going to affect both businesses approach to occupying office space and requiring people to commute to work because that's expensive to rent and and lease um, business space and, and office space you know but I think it's also going to affect us as individuals um, a lot of us are going to run away from this going I am never going to be a teacher and thank God for all of the public school teachers. <laughs> and we're gonna send my kids back to school. <laughs> and I think a lot of other people are gonna say, you know, this is much more the pace I wanna have and how much I wanna be able to see my family. So I'm, I'm curious how the world is going to look from you know, the economic perspective down to families and individuals after we go through this, this strange time. Yeah, I know how I was as a kid, and I know my mom is thanking the heavens that this <laughs> didn't happen while I was at home because I was a ter terror. But, <laughs> um, you know, that then you have the question, like, here's the master plan. Does everybody just work from home? I mean, we can do it now. And, you know, does, does, now does, does that question come up? Well, I think it's uh, like a lot of other environmental co conversations we have in the state of Utah, it probably will boil down to the bottom line, whether it's your family's budget or it's your business plan and the strategic ability for your business to grow and be sustainable. Um, people are going to make decisions based on their bottom line. But from an environmental perspective, this is a really great potential opportunity for us as a community to say, how do we want to live differently? And do we, um, and I think we're valuing our parks and our trails in a unique, unique way right now. Well, yeah, thank heavens we can get out and be there. And perhaps this will spur a stronger conversation for us as a community about investing in better connections to those trails and parks and what is in our parks and amenities like that. So I think about almost everything through an environmental lens and I can't help but see some silver lining benefits to this time that we're in on our environment. You know, you are 
the third female mayor in out of 36 uh, mayors in, in Salt Lake City. What advice do you have for, you know, women in jobs that are some, somewhat male dominant? Um, Definitely. And, and what advice do you have for them to continue pushing forward? Because I know you were once you once a little girl in Sandy, right? In, yeah, I went in to Alpha Sandy, High School. Yeah, in Utah, you, you went to the University of Utah, and I'm sure there were some trials and tribulations and, and okay. tough moments. And what did you stick to to not give up and, and reach this end goal and then be successful when so much pressure has been put on you? Well, thanks, George, for the nice uh, compliments a moment ago, too. I think um, it's really important to recognize that in the state of Utah, uh, women are uh, we have the lowest status in the country, and that's measured by access to um, job promotions, by wage equity, meaning men and women doing the exact same job with the same qualifications, getting paid uh, 70 cents on the dollar for every man um, doing the same job. Uh, there's a there are a number of factors that are evaluated, and year over year, we either we are either 49th or 50th in the status of women. So I just say that from the outset because when I was a little girl, I felt like I had a lot to give and I, uh, I've always loved people and I've, um, I've always wanted to do something for, for my community in a big way, which makes a lot of sense why I went into grassroots organizing and nonprofit work in the beginning. But I did not see myself as a political um, elected person. Um, and I, I think that a lot of women and girls, actually I know that a lot of women and girls in Utah, but even throughout the world, don't grow up seeing themselves achieving things like that. Our culture has a lot to do with that. So even though my parents said, you can be anything you want, I had no idea how to get there, if you know what I mean. Yes. And so it was like doing, it was making a series of decisions that ended up leading me on a path toward where I am today. We are half of the population and in the state of Utah, we are only 24% of all the elected seats in the state. We can do so much better. We can at least do 26% better. So we're half of the representation. And your voice, your experience, no matter what that experience is, matters to your community and your community can hear themselves and see themselves in what you've been through and where you stand. So I encourage you to step up and participate in things like the Real Women Run group, which is a bipartisan opportunity for women to figure out what it might take to run for office. I love it. I love it. That is, it, it's so cool and, and so inspiring, I'm sure, not just for only uh, younger women, women uh, that are older, but you know, just to see a woman in position of power and taking on everything that you've taken on and taking it with stride and knowing that our community is succeeding in a time where it's really hard to succeed. So thank you Thanks. so much. Our and community is awesome. It really is. I love it here. I'm a East Coast kid and what had people had talked about what Utah was when I was an East Coast kid. I'm never going to repeat. Utah <laughs> is an amazing place. It's so wonderful. The people are so genuine. And even even people like you, like on Twitter today, ask Mayor Mendenhall. I have a question. Shoot. shoot. I've always <laughs> wanted to say that to an NBA player. Yeah, you don't need to say that to me. I shoot all the time. When I catch it, I, the ground doesn't even get to touch it. I'm shooting. <laughs> Ask Mayor Mendenhall, who is your favorite jazz player? It's you, George. <laughs> she got it right. We're going to end it but right I want, there. I want one of those shirts you have. Okay, we'll we'll send you one. We'll okay. send you one and we'll call it even. I won't I'll ask wear it with my either. selfie stick on Twitter. Mayor Mendenhall, thank you so much for joining me on the Driving Dish podcast. I really appreciate all your insight. And it really means a lot, not only to me, but the community with how great you, uh, with how great you're doing. Thank you, George. I'm so glad you're part of Salt Lake City. And it was really fun to be on your podcast today. Such a great break from other things. Oh, I can only imagine. <laughs> Thank you again. I really appreciate it. <laughs>